Good evening and welcome to you all who have joined us for our worship this evening. The services next Lord's Day will be at 12 noon in Port Mahomac and 6.30 p.m. in Inver Meeting House. And the preacher expected is Mr. Lindsay McCallum. The midweek meeting will be on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. There's the January edition of the Free Church Witness magazine, and it is available now for those who have it on order. These are all the intimations, God willing. <clears throat> Let us now worship God and sing to his praise from Psalm 25. Psalm 25 will sing from the first version, from verse 1 down to the end of 7. Psalm 25, verse 1. To thee I lift my soul, O Lord, I trust in thee. My God, let me not be ashamed, nor false triumph over me. Let none that wait on thee be put to shame at all, but those that without cause transgress, let shame upon them fall. Show me thy ways, O Lord, thy paths, O teach thou me, and do thou lead me in thy truth, therein my teacher be. For thou art God that dost to me salvation send, and I upon thee all the day expecting do attend. And so on to the end of verse 7, to God's praise.
Let us pray. Gracious God and ever blessed Father in heaven, we indeed come into your presence this evening and confessing our sins and our shortcomings and remembering that it is only because of your mercies that we can stand and uh, approach your holy presence. We are thankful, O oh Lord, for your word that conveys to us who you truly are, and most of all for having sent uh, into this world your Son, who took upon himself flesh and bones like, uh, like us all. Lord, we are thankful for his life of perfect obedience and sinless behavior and nature. We are thankful, O oh Lord, for you have provided a salvation which is far above our own imagination and abilities for all you have done, for uh, providing a substitute for our own sins. And so, Lord, we pray that we may be given light and wisdom and comfort this evening as we come and bow down at your presence, as we long to hear your voice, not only read in your uh, book in our hands, but especially heard by the indwelling of your Spirit. Father, uh, speak to each one, we pray, of your people here. Bless those who are uh, listening from home, those who are seeking and asking questions for their own souls. Lord, uh, send your in your mercy and your grace, uh, your spirit from above, and revive us all, we pray. For we need you, O Lord, we confess we have no light in ourselves, but we depend on you, O Lord. And so we pray for your church here in this place, in this small village. We ask, O Lord, that your word preached from week to week may bear fruit and um, bring glory to your own name. Lord, we uh, live in days where there is much hatred for your word and for who you are, and we ask uh, that your people may be strengthened, uh, that all over this land, everywhere your word is preached faithfully and with passion, it may uh, bring encouragement and uh, revival and uh, uh, hope uh, for sinners who are uh, who don't know answers and don't know where to go and are lost in their blindness and sins. Lord, give us uh, a heart uh, of mercy and compassion for our Neighbors, we pray, strengthen us, O Lord, with your word and spirit this evening and lead us day by day uh, into the way everlasting. Uh, we pray not only for this congregation, but for all those in our own denomination that are without a pastor over themselves. Lord, we pray that you may provide for them and we ask with all our heart, O Lord, that you may um, send laborers into the fields, O oh Lord. We pray um, that uh, many and many more may uh, be called by your very voice, that many may come into the kingdom of Christ and fight the good faith of the good fight of faith. We pray so, O oh Lord, for all nations, and we are thankful for your word is being preached and your kingdom is advancing despite what we see locally and in this area of the world around us. We are thankful, O oh Lord, for uh, the, the gates of hell will never prevail against your church. And so we are thankful for the many missionaries and your servants who uh, even in places of war and persecutions at this time are 
faithfully going forth and preaching the gospel and serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, we pray for our brother Parthipan in Sri Lanka. We remember our uh, brethren in France and in Spain. And we pray too for our uh, friends in North America and elsewhere, everywhere they are preaching the gospel and have a love for your word and for the kingdom of God. Lord, unite us, we pray. Um, grant uh, to each one in this congregation to know of your loving hand, gu guiding them and leading them in every difficulties and decisions to be made in the near future. Be not uh, far, O oh Lord, but hear our cry we ask for your name's sake. Amen. We shall continue to sing from Psalm 25, <clears throat> this time from the second version. Psalm 25, the second version, from verse 10. The second version of Psalm 25, verse 10. The whole paths of the Lord our God are truth and mercy sure to such as keep his covenant and testimonies pure. Now, for thine own name's sake, O Lord, I humbly thee entreat to pardon mine iniquity, for it is very great. What man fears God? Him shall he teach the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease. His seed, the earth, as heirs shall use. The secret of the Lord is with such as do fear his name, and he his holy covenant will manifest to them. Towards the Lord my waiting eyes continually are set, for he it is that shall bring forth my feet out of the net. These verses from 10 to 15, the second version of Psalm 25. Let us turn to the New Testament and read from the first letter of Peter, chapter 1.
The first epistle of Peter, chapter 1. This is the word of God. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of, by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory." receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Amen. God bless his precious word. 
Let us now sing from Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We sing the portion from verse 41 down to 48. Psalm 119, verse 41. Let thy sweet mercies also come and visit me, O Lord, even thy benign salvation according to thy word. So shall I, hear wherewith I may, give him an answer just, who spitefully reproacheth me. For in thy word I trust. Down to the end of verse 48 from 41 to God's praise. <clears throat> Let us continue to read from the first letter of Peter and now into chapter 4. First epistle of Peter, chapter 4. Let us read the word of God. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, 
When he walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For this cause, for... Um, Apologies. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. But God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I'd like to draw your attention um, to verses 12 and 13 in this chapter, uh, especially with the words uh, beginning of verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. <clears throat> Beloved, think it not strange. You may even translate this with the words, be not surprised. Be not surprised. I remember I was a, a young boy sitting right somewhere uh, near the pulpit as if it was there. I still remember very clearly. I wasn't a Christian, but I was struck and it's still clear in my mind the face of the preacher who was preaching from the beginning of this chapter and he spoke about the sufferings of Christ. And he said, arm yourselves, look at verse 1, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. And he was going on and on and explaining how the Christian life is 
to be equipped and to be acquainted with the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. To me, that uh, struck something in my, my mind because I, to that point, I thought the Christians should be somebody that are only happy and joyful and never have any problems. That was my uh, naive idea of the Christian. But Peter here is writing this letter to those who were indeed persecuted in all kinds of ways. These Christians who received this letter were scattered abroad. We read in chapter 1. They have been scattered away from their homeland. They were suffering many trials and normal day life on top of physical persecutions and even death just because they were followers of Christ. And so here we have an apostle who is writing and encouraging these believers and he is telling them, be not surprised of what you are going through. How on earth can you believe a religion like this? How on earth these Christians went on and on and kept their faith and witnessed for the centuries ahead and so many more and we have the Lord Jesus Christ today with so many followers and so many more and all the persecutions that went on in the first few centuries didn't wipe out the church at all. There must be a secret in all this. There must be the, re the real reason for what Christ is saying here. And Peter, first of all, first more than others, must have been grasped this for sure. It's quite remarkable that Peter is writing to these believers, to these people who he's calling brethren, with such an, an affectionate heart. He is calling them uh, brethren. He is uh, addressing them as um, the children of God. He is using this word beloved so many times in, this in these two letters. He is not the apostle who is looking down on them and he's telling them, you just go and I'm, I'm living my own life. He's not in a palace full of riches and telling them, with dismissing them, who cares about your suffering. He is someone that has gone through himself persecutions and trials. And he says, be not surprised. So I'd like to draw a few lessons from Peter's own life that have been obviously uh, taught by the Lord Jesus Christ and have been teaching these believers and are teaching us as the followers of Jesus because it is the same pattern. It is the same things that we all are to learn as followers of Christ, as those who are suffering and have the same mind of the Lord Jesus, being his children and followers. And so I'd like to look at Peter and have a, a quick glimpse on his own life and see what the Lord taught him and what the Lord is teaching us uh, in following him, in being his disciples. And we um, may want to look at Peter as a man of faith, Peter as a man of failures, and Peter as a man of affections. These three things uh, come out from all his life and even from this letter as he is teaching all believers of all times. Peter, first of all, Peter, a man of faith. Peter is a man that has demonstrated faith in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Peter was looking for the Messiah promised in the Old Testament times. And Peter was introduced to this man, Jesus, by his own brother. You remember in John chapter 1, after they heard John the Baptist, they followed Christ. The disciples followed Christ. And Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Peter was introduced to Christ by his own brother. And he must have been a sincere disciple of God, reading the scriptures, having clear that the Messiah had to come. And his brother appears to him and says, look, we have found him. Come and see. He was ser surely searching the truth. How many times he must have been questioning in his own mind and prayer to God, when is he coming? When will I find? Will I ever see? Will I ever receive the blessings of the King, the Messiah, the Christ? Well, this happened in his life. But Peter also was a man of faith that you um, received this faith by grace alone. He knew it was a gift of God. And that is what so clearly was told by the Lord himself. You remember when uh, Jesus did ask the disciples, who do you think I am? And Simon Peter was the first replying, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus immediately answered and told Peter, You are blessed, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Right away Peter was told, What you have seen, what you believe, what you have come to, uh, your faith that has given you this light, it's not of your own. It comes from God. It's a gift. And then this man, Peter, uh, although he received this faith, he was looking for the Messiah, he, he saw his own faith growing in his own life by his own experience. Of all that we have said so far, it doesn't mean that Peter believed Christ and met him and all was well and he, he knew all things and he was sort of arrived. But Peter's faith had to grow. And one day, you remember that experience of the catching of fishes uh, at Jesus' command when Peter who already knew all these things and met the Lord in such a way. In that occasion, when Jesus, in Luke chapter 5, um, <clears throat> brought that miracle, Peter saw it, and we read in chapter 5, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished at all that were and all that were with him. So interesting and touching that Peter believed the Lord, and yet he had so much to learn. When he realized the miracle of Christ, he he was almost face to face to his God, and he was uh, overwhelmed. He fell down at Jesus' feet and worshipped. That's what you and I need continually, don't we? To discover more of the Lord and so that our faith may grow and that we may praise Him and bow down in worship and marvel for who Christ is. Surely at that point Peter understood a little bit more of Jesus' power and majesty and of his own sinful nature. 
What did he say to Jesus? Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. What a glorious discovery this is, although painful. But faith is what causes you to see your own reality, your own sin. And so all this, uh, yes, is telling us about Peter's faith. And even more, uh, there is one other incident that is teaching us that faith uh, Peter's faith was truly genuine. It was a spontaneous faith. Um, because he saw the Lord, Jesus, uh, the Lord Jesus as the most important person he has met so far in his life. He was indeed blessed to be with Jesus. And when in Mark chapter 1, when the Lord is calling the disciples, um, Jesus spoke uh, to both Andrew and Simon, and he said, Come ye after me. And I will make you to become fishers of men. And Mark, in his own way, put, put it so clearly in verse 18. And straight away they forsook their nets and followed him. They didn't think twice. They followed the Lord sincerely, promptly, trusting in him. Only these few sketches must teach us, must teach us how sincere and true Peter's faith was and what you need to approach Christ. You need this wonderful, precious gift of God that Peter, in his letter, is uh, in chapter 1, is describing as the most precious thing you have received from God from above. More precious than gold, than uh, anything else in this world. Your faith that is God-given. Do you have such faith tonight? Can you bow down to Christ and even cry for more? For you have met him and you know, you know him and you don't want anything nor anybody else more precious in your life. Peter was a man of faith. And I, I quote to you Spurgeon when in his own biography he says and speaks about the Savior and describes in a way his own faith as well. This is Spurgeon's word, I quote, I want none beside him, which is Jesus. In life, he is my life. In death, he shall be the death of death. In poverty, Christ is my riches. In sickness, he makes my bed. In darkness, he is my star. And in brightness, he is my sun. That's what faith says. That's what God's given faith to you leads you to be like. Do you recognize yourself here tonight? Are you so thankful if you have this, even in a small measure, that this is a gift of God and you have brought nothing to make it so? A gift of sovereign free grace there's nothing in which you can boast of it's only a matter of worshipping on your knees your savior just like Peter so you can guess a little bit see a little bit more how on earth Peter can encourage these believers that are suffering and how he has gone through much suffering and he's able to say, by faith, this is to be a Christian. He was not only a man of faith, but he was also a man of failures. How so? Well, thankfully, the Word of God is not painting for us any lie 
He, the Word of God is not painting us a Peter who is not real and is a superman. But we know, reading through the Gospels, and by his own admission, that Peter was a sinner like you and me. And again, this is the proof. There's no boasting in all this. Peter was, at times, an arrogant man. He was a foolish man. He was ignorant. He was slow to understand many things. And he demonstrated often to be proud and self-confident. And even at last, a denial of the Savior. He did deny the Savior, as you all well know. How sad, from the human point of view, it is to look at all the failures of Peter and think that God used him as the first preacher and the apostle in New Testament times. But this is our God. So I can give you many examples, but very quickly, you I'm sure you remember when the Lord began to explain that he had to suffer and go to Jerusalem and be killed and, and that he would be taken and he had to suffer and go through the experience of the cross. Peter, in that occasion, took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto you. And the Lord had to rebuke Peter and actually using very harsh words that are shocking to us today. But Jesus said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. What a shameful experience for a disciple who had grown so much and yet failed and demonstrated his arrogant attitude in dismissing the Savior's words and his teaching. You remember when along with James and John, Peter was up on the mountain uh, at the Transfiguration, and he came up with a weird comment where we find this in Mark chapter 9. Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he, we are told by Mark, for he, Peter, wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. Would this be a preacher, an apostle that you would trust and listen? He didn't know what to say. He spoke foolishness. He was so um, moved by his own impulses and feelings. And even more, when the time came um, before the supper, with the disciples and Jesus uh, bowed down and washed the feet of all the twelve. You remember how Peter reacted when Jesus uh, reached his point and Peter's feet, Je Peter said, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Thou shalt never wash my feet. But Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. He had to yet understand that the Lord came to serve and be humble and humble himself for his disciples. He was so slow to understand. And even at his lowest point, perhaps, when he denied the Lord, he did this not in front of a big army, but at the testimony of a young woman. 
a young girl, we are told in Matthew 26, a damsel. For the third time, she asked him a question, and he again denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And even more, we read in Matthew 26, verse 74, Then began Peter to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. What a failure. What an attitude. Is he one of the best apostles that he, upon whom Christ is going to uh, spread the gospel? And yet, you and I, brethren, if you are a child of God tonight, I'm sure you know that you must come to this point of failure like Peter. That you must come to see that you are to cry bitterly because of your sins and your offenses to the Lord. And yet learn even then, yes, that there is space in the arms of Christ for you to be forgiven. Is this your case tonight even? Have you been experiencing some of these similar failures of Peter this very week? Pride, ignorance, slow to understand, self-confident, full of ourselves, and even denying the Lord's among others. Yes, Peter was a man of failures, but he was a forgiven man. He was perfectly, completely forgiven, washed fully by the powerful blood of Christ. That's what Peter came to see. That's why he was ready to suffer all things for Christ's sake. For his Savior suffered the cross and paid for all his failures. This Peter's knew. Do you know this? Do you believe the Lord has paid for all of your failures and even the future ones? You see, this leads us to see how on earth Peter and all these believers and all the children of God of all history are men of faith, men of failures, men and women of great affections. Yes, because the demonstration of this true faith comes out with this love for the Savior. It brings us to see how Peter truly loved the Lord Jesus. What did he answer? When the Lord spoke to the twelve on one occasion and he said to them, Will you also go away from me? Everybody was disappointed because of what Jesus said. And so he challenged the disciples and he said, You can go away. Are you not going away? And then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter loved the Lord. He didn't want to go anywhere else, for he knew the Lord was his life giver. He was his Savior. This he grasped. This was enough for him to love the Lord, and also because he saw by faith that Christ was to become the substitute for his sins. When Peter saw the Lord um, after the resurrection, in John chapter 21, we read that when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fishers coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. He ran toward the Lord on the shore. He loved him. And all his affections were for Jesus. 
And even then, in that occasion, when Christ repeated three times and asked three times to Peter if he truly loved him, he reigns told Peter with his calling for uh, the kingdom of God. And Peter only had to answer, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. His heart was all for Christ. And so he is able to say to all these persecuted believers and to all of us tonight, do not fear of anything that, the man, that man can do. Check out what kind of faith you have. Confess all your failures and love the Lord with all your heart. Be not surprised at all. Beloved, think it not strange. See the heart of love with which Paul Peter is now able to say these things after all he experienced. He can tell you even tonight, rejoice, my brethren, because you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. This is all that matters. You can bear all things when you love the Lord and you know who he is and what he has done to save you. May the Lord bless his word. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again tonight for your word and for what we need to be reminded once more. And we pray, O oh God, that you may revive our faith, that we may be grounded and, and, uh, again more and more in your word, and we may uh, truly confess and see who we are. Lord, we are thankful for your patience and for your loving kindness, just as you have been showing your mercy to a man like Peter and even to many more like ourselves. Lord, we pray that we may be given to worship your precious name, not only with our lips, but with our hearts and with our uh, behavior, with our own lives all the day long. Forgive our sins, we ask, and bless us in Christ for his name's sake. Amen. Let us conclude with Psalm 27. Psalm 27, singing from verse 7 down through 11. Psalm 27, verse 7. O Lord, give ear unto my voice. When I do cry to thee, upon me also mercy heaven, do thou answer me. When thou didst say, Seek ye my face, then unto thee reply, Thus did my heart, above all things, thy face, Lord, seek, will I. Down to the end of verse 11, to the praise of God.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.